the adventure of the speckled band learning objectives 1 to learn how to fight against life's troubles 2 to understand a young woman's courage warm up be a detective crime case board help sherlock holmes create a crime case board find a large piece of card or board copy and cut out the different characters and places at the end of the resources and gradually add them to the board as you read through the story add any information clues or questions to it be a detective investigation sheet use the sheet at the end of the resources to write down any clues questions your deductions or answers that may come up in this chapter Conan Doyle 1859 to 1930 was a Scottish writer and physician most famous for creating the fictional detective Sherlock Holmes and writing stories about him which are generally considered milestones in the field of the crime fiction He was a prominent writer whose other works include fantasy and science fiction stories plays romances poetry non-fiction and historical novels Doyle was also known as spiritualism ambassador a passion that was started in 1873 when he joined the Society of Physical Research his passion for spiritualism is reflected in his writing during the later part of his life the adventure of the speckled band is one of the most famous short stories of sherlock holmes a young woman named helen stoner hires sherlock holmes and dr watson in foiling the villainous plans of her stepfather grimsby roylott it was early in april in the year 83 that i woke one morning to find sherlock holmes standing fully dressed by the side of my bed very sorry to knock you up watson a young lady has arrived who insists upon seeing me i presume that is something very pressing a lady dressed in black and heavily wheeled who had been sitting in the window rose as we entered good morning madam said holmes cheerfully my name is sherlock holmes this is my intimate friend and associate dr watson before whom you can speak as freely as before me i observe that you are shivering i shall order some hot coffee it is not cold which makes me shiver said the woman in low voice changing her seat as requested what then it is fear mr holmes it is terror she raised her veil as she spoke and we could see her face all drawn and gray with restless frightened eyes like those of some hunted animal you must not fear said he soothingly we shall soon set matters right i have no doubt oh sir do you not think that you could help me i'm all attention madam my name is helen stoner and i am living with my stepfather dr roylott when dr roylott was in india he married my mother mrs stoner the young widow of major general stoner my sister julia and i were twins and were only 2 years old at the time of my mother's remarriage she had a considerable son of money not less than 1000 pounds a year and this she bequeathed to dr roylott entirely when we resided with him with a provision that a certain annual sum should be allowed to each of us in the event of our marriage shortly after our return to england my mother died a terrible change came over our stepfather about this time instead of making friends and exchanging visits with our neighbors he indulged in ferocious quarrels with whoever might cross his path he had no friends at all save the wandering gypsies who he would give to live and camp upon his land he has a passion also for indian animals and he has at this moment a cheetah and a baboon which wander freely over his grounds and are feared by the villagers almost as much as their master you can imagine from what i say that my poor sister julia and i had no great pleasure in our lives no servant would stay with us and for a long time we did all the work of the house she was 30 at the time of her death your sister is dead then i wish to speak to you about her death julia met a half pay major of marines at 
Christmas, to whom she became engaged, must have father learned of the engagement and offered no objection to the marriage. But within a fortnight of the day which had been fixed for the wedding, the terrible event occurred which has deprived me of my only companion. That fatal night, Dr. Roylott had gone to his room early. She left her room, therefore, and came into mine, where she sat for some time chatting about her approaching wedding. At eleven o'clock, she rose to leave me, but she paused at the door and locked back. Tell me, Helen, said, have you ever heard anyone whistle in the dead of the night? Certainly not, but why? Because during the last few nights, I have always about three in the morning heard a low, clear whistle. I am a light sleeper and it has awakened me. I cannot tell where it came from. Perhaps from the next room, perhaps from the lawn. She smiled back at me, closed my door and few moments later, I heard her key turn in the lock. I could not sleep that night. A vague feeling of impending misfortune impressed me. My sister and I, you will recollect were twins and you know how subtle are the links which bind two souls which are so closely allied. It was a wild night, the wind was howling outside and the rain was beating and splashing against the windows. Suddenly, amid all the hubbub of the gale, there burst forth the wild scream of a terrified woman. I knew that it was my sister's voice. I sprang from my bed, wrapped a shawl around me and rushed into the corridor. As I opened my door, I seemed to hear a low whistle, such as my sister described, and a few moments later, a clanging sound as if a mass of metal had fallen. As I ran down the passage, my sister's door was unlocked and revolved slowly upon its hinges. I stared at it, horror striking, not knowing what was about to issue from it. By the light of the corridor lamp, I saw my sister appear at the opening, her face blanched with terror, her hands groping for help, her whole figure swaying to an pro like that of a drunkard. I ran to her and threw my arms round her, but at that moment her knees seemed to give way and she fell to the ground. She writhed as one who is in terrible pain and her limbs were dreadfully convulsed. At first I thought she had not recognized me, but as I bent over her, she suddenly shrieked out in a voice which I shall never forget. Oh my god, Helen! It was the band, the speckled band. There was something else which she would fain have said, and she stabbed with her finger into the air in the direction of the doctor's room, but a fresh convulsion seized her and choked her words and she slowly sank and died without having recovered her consciousness. Such was the dreadful end of my beloved sister. Was it poison? The doctors examined her for it, but without success. Ah, and what did he gather from this allusion to a band, a speckled band? Sometimes I have thought that it was merely the wild talk of delirium, sometimes that I may have referred to some band of people, perhaps to these very gypsies in the plantation. Holmes shook his head like a man who is far from being satisfied. There are these are very deep waters, said he. Pray go on with your narrative. A month ago, a dear friend whom I known for many years has done me the honor to ask my hand in marriage. His name is Armitage, Percy Armitage. My stepfather has offered no opposition to the match. Two days ago, some repairs were started in the west wing of the building so that I had to move into the chamber in which my sister died and to sleep in the very bed in which she slept, imagine, then my thrill of terror when last night as I lay awake thinking over her terrible fate, I suddenly heard in the silence of the night the low whistle which had been the herald of her own death. I sprang up and lit the lamp, but nothing was to be seen in the room. I was too shaken to go bed again. However, so I dressed, and as soon as it was daylight, I came with the one subject of seeing you and asking your advice. 
This is a very deep business, he said at last. There are a thousand details which I should desire to know before I decide upon our course of action. Yet, we had not a moment to lose. If we were to come to Stoke Moran today, would it be possible for us to see over these rooms without the knowledge of her stepfather? Is it probable as my stepfather will be away all the day? Excellent, then Watson and I will soon be there. She bowed and took leave. Sherlock Holmes went out for some work and was soon back looking serious. Once they set out, he said, I have seen the will of the deceased wife, said he. It is evident from the will that if both girls had married, their stepfather would have had a mere pretense. My morning's work has not been wasted since it has proved that he has the very strongest motives for standing in the way of anything of the sort. We soon reached our destination. Our client of the morning had hurried forward to meet us with a face which spoke her joy. All has turned out splendidly. Dr. Roylott has gone to town and it is unlikely that he will be back before evening. Now we must make the best use of our time, so kindly take us at once to the rooms which we are to examine. Where does that bell communicate with? Entering the room, he asked at last, pointing to a thick bell rope which he hung down beside the bed. The tassel actually lying upon the pillow, he took the bell rope in his hand and gave it a brisk tug. Why, it's a dummy, said he. Won't it ring? No, it's not even attached to a wire. You can see now that it is fastened to a hook just above where the little opening for the ventilator is. What a fool! This builder must be to open a ventilator into another room, when the same trouble he might have communicated with the outside air. Dr. Grimsby Roylaw's chamber was larger than that of his stepdaughter, but was as plainly furnished, a camp bed, an armchair beside the bed, a round table, and a large iron safe were the principal things which met the eye. Holmes walked slowly round and examined each and all of them with the keenest interest. What's in here? he asked, tapping the safe. My stepfather's business papers are in it. There isn't a cat in it, for example. No, what a strange idea. Well, look at this. He took up a small saucer of milk which stood on top of it. No, we don't keep a cat, but there is a cheetah and a baboon. Ah, yes, of course. Hello, here is something interesting. The object which had caught his eye was a small dog lash hung on one corner of the bed. The lash, however, was curled upon itself and tied so as to make a loop of whipcord. The master is too serious for any hesitation. Your life may depend on your co plans in the first place. Both my friend and I must spend the night in your room. Both Miss Stoner and I gazed at him in astonishment. Let me explain. You must confine yourself to your room on pretense of a headache when your stepfather comes back. Then when you hear him retire for the night, you must open the window, put your lamp there as a signal to us and then withdraw quietly into the room which you used to occupy. The rest you will leave in our hands. Goodbye and be brave. We shall soon drive away the dangers that threaten you. Did you observe that the bed was clamped to the floor? The lady could not move her bed. It must always be in the same relative position to the ventilator and to the rope, or so we may call it since it was clearly never meant for a bell pull. Holmes, I cried. I seem to see dimly what you are hinting at. We are only just in time to prevent some subtle and horrible crime. About nine o'clock, the light among the trees was extinguished and all was dark in the direction of the manor house. Two hours passed slowly away, and then suddenly, just at the stroke of eleven, a single bright light shone out right in front of us. That is our signal, said Holmes, springing to his feet. A moment later, we were out on the dark road, a chill wind blowing in our faces and one yellow light twinkling in front of us. I soon found myself inside the bedroom. My companion noiselessly closed the shutters, moved the lamp onto the table and cast his eyes round the room. 
all was as we had seen in it the daytime. The least sound would be fatal to our plans. He whispered. I nodded to show that I had heard. We must sit without light. I nodded again. Holmes had brought up a long thin cane, and this he placed upon the bed beside him. By it he laid the box of matches and stump of a candle. Suddenly there was the momentary gleam of a light up in the direction of the ventilator. Then suddenly another sound became audible, a very gentle, soothing sound like that of a small jet of steam escaping continually from a kettle. The instant that we heard it, Holmes sprang from the bed, struck a match, and lashed furiously with his cane at the bell pull. He had ceased to strike and was gazing up at the ventilator when suddenly there broke from the silence of the night the most horrible cry to which I have ever listened. It was a dreadful shriek. It struck cold to our hearts, and I stood gazing at Holmes and he at me until the last echoes of it had died away into the silence from which it rose. What can it mean? I gasped. It means that it is all over, Holmes answered. Take your pistol and we will enter Dr. Roy Lord's room. It was a singular riot which met our eyes. Beside the table on the wooden chair sat Dr. Grimsby Roy Lord. Across his, lap, across his lap lay the long lash. His chain was cocked upward and his eyes were fixed in a dreadful, rigid stare at the corner of the ceiling. Round his brow he had a peculiar yellow band with the brownish speckles which seemed to be bound tightly round his head. As we entered, he made neither sound nor motion. The band, the speckled band, whispered Holmes. I took a step forward in an instant his strange headgear began to move and there reared itself from among his hair the squat diamond shaped head and puffed neck of a loathsome serpent. It is a swamp adder, cried Holmes, the deadliest snake in India. He has died within 10 seconds of being bitten. Violence does in truth recoil upon the violin and the schemer falls into the pit which he digs for another. As he spoke, he drew the dog whip swiftly from the dead man's lap and throwing the noose round the reptile's neck, he drew it from its horrid perch and carrying it at arm's length, threw it into the iron safe which he closed upon it. We broke the sad news to the terrified girl and sent her to the care of her good aunt at Harrow. The slow process of official inquiry came to the conclusion that the doctor met his fate while indiscreetly playing with a dangerous pet. The little witch I had yet to learn of the case was told me by Sherlock Holmes as we travelled back next day. According to Holmes, the ventilator and the bell rope caught his attention. The discovery that this was a dummy and that the bed was clamped to the door instantly gave rise to the suspicion that the rope was there as a bridge for something passing through the hole and coming to the bed. The idea of a snake instantly occurred to me and when I coupled it with my knowledge that the doctor was furnished with a suppy with a supply of creatures from India, I felt that I was probably on the right track. The idea of using a form of poison which could not possibly be discovered by any chemical test and the rapidity with which such a poison would take effect was known to him. Then I thought of the whistle. He had trained it probably by the use of the milk which we saw to return to him when summoned. He would put it through this ventilator with the certainty that it would crawl down the rope and land on the bed. It would bite the occupant and come back. An inspection of his chair showed me that he had been in the habit of standing on it, which of course would be necessary in order that he should reach the ventilator. The metallic clang heard by Miss Toner was obviously caused by her stepfather hastily closing the door of his safe upon its terrible occupant. Having once made up my mind, as soon as I heard the creature hiss, I instantly attacked it. With the result of driving it through the ventilator, some of the blows of my cane came home and roused its snackish temper so that it flew upon the first person it saw. In this way, I am no doubt indirectly responsible for Dr. Grimsby Roylott's death. Conan Doyle Fine meaning!
bequeathed, gave or left by will. Ferocious, violent, fortnight, 15 days, days between full moon and new moon. Deprived, disadvantaged, fatal, deadly, impending, awaiting, misfortune, disaster. Exercises Creative Expression Tell your story 1. Why Sherlock Holmes was indirectly responsible for Dr. Roy Lord's death? Think and discuss your thoughts in class. 2. Mystery is something that is undefined, unknown or anonymous. It is not anything that is definite or specific. Mystery is something that is difficult or impossible to understand or explain. A mystery about a place, an event or a person can be exciting to few and scary to others at the same time. Is there any other way by which you could think of outwitting Dr. Roylott? Describe how you would have tackled it had you been approached by Helen. Cross Curricular Connect Learning by Doing Read these headlines and write news on any of the two topics. 1. A pride line strolling through the city. 2. Air pollutants at an all-time high. 3. Covid protocol. 4. Government of India bans the production and use of plastics. 5. Biodegradable products are prevalent. Critical thinking. Let's play a game. What do you think about each of these pictures? Describe in your words, speak about these games and why they are good for mental health. Logical thinking. Choose the correct options. 1. I am happy. 2. Rice tastes good with chicken. 3. He is wearing a blue shirt. 4. Roberto plays soccer. 5. You drive a car to work. 6. Tom uses a fork to eat. 7. Jenny is a good student. 8. Cars takes people from one place to another. 9. You have a nice smile. 10. Those pencils need to be sharpened. Exercise time! Answer the following questions. 1. Who was Mr. Watson? Answer. Mr. Watson was Holmes' friend and roommate who frequently assists during his cases. He is modest and intelligent. He is a patient and sensitive observer, but his detecting capabilities are no match for the lightning swift deductive reasoning of Holmes. 2. Who was the young lady? Why did she visit Sherlock Holmes? Answer. The young lady is named Helen Stoner. She has come to Holmes because of a number of suspicious occurrences in her family home that have her afraid of her life. She lives with her abusive stepfather, a man by the name of Grimsby Roylott, and until recently, she also lived with her twin sister, Julia, who died under suspicious circumstances. Helen has since been forced to move on to move into her late sister's room, and she has started hearing the same noises that preceded her sister's death. Further, her sister died two weeks before she was scheduled to be married and now Helen is engaged. Her stepfather's income comes from the estate of her late mother and is said to be reduced by part when the girls marry, which would leave him with very little income, giving him a great deal of motives for the murders, a fact Helen is well aware of. 3. How did, how did Roy Lord's family lose all the money they had? Answer: The Roylott family lost its wealth through a succession of poor hires who across the span of a century squandered the family fortune, leaving the family in financial ruin. These details are important because they provide the motive behind Dr. Roylott's crimes. He manages to marry, gaining access to his wife's fortune, but under the terms that he provides each of his stepdaughters an annuity upon their getting married, a condition which given his already severe financial distress would result in financial ruin. When Helen's sister Julia is engaged to be married, she dies under mysterious circumstances killed by Roylott and now that Helen is engaged as well, that history is repeating once again. Terrified, she returns to Holmes for his assistance and proceeds to unveil the truth of the Roylott case even as Roylott himself is killed. Number 4. What happened on the fateful night that Julia died? Answer. Julia had gone to her sister's room to talk. 
she spoke of noises in the night, specifically a whistle that Julia heard in the wee morning hours. When Julia went back to her own room, she locked her bedroom door, as did her sister. That evening was described as wild. There was a storm, and Helen heard her sister scream. The night were homes, and Watson spent in Helen's sister Julia's room was a terrifying one. Julia died in her own room, and the killer killed her, leaving no such clues at all. Till Holmes found the motive and way she killed, and why she was killed. As they were silently waiting, suddenly they heard a shrill whistle. Five. Why did Holmes want to spend the night in Helen's room? Answer. Holmes wanted to spend the night in Helen's room. Even doesn't like sleeping in Julia's room and in Julia's bed for obvious reasons. She would naturally feel the room might be haunted. This fear plus the strange whistle she hears during the night combined to make her hasten to London. To consult Sherlock Holmes, number six. Which things gave rise to the suspicion in Sherlock Holmes' mind, and how? Answer: Sherlock Holmes rose some questions based on suspicious things. Holmes was expecting a snake when he and Watson were sitting in silence in the former bedroom of Julia Stoner, which had recently been assigned to her sister Helen. What the two men did not realize is that the snake is actually there on the bed for several hours. Holmes didn't see it until at around 3:30 in the morning. He heard the low whistles his client Helen had told him about. That means Dr. Roylott is summoning it. Back of the well pool, through the ventilator and into his adjoining room, Holmes strikes a match and lashes at the speckled band clamping back to the ventilator. Since Holmes had been sitting on the side of the bed, he must have been sitting very close to the coiled snake for several hours without knowing it. Holmes sees other evidences when he examines the bedroom earlier in the day. Dr. Roylott has a dog leash with a nose, with a noose fashioned at the end of it. He has a saucer containing some milk on the top of a steel safe. Holmes deduces that Roylott has trained a snake to return through the ventilator at the sound of a low whistle by rewarding it with milk and then locking it in the safe. Holmes examines the plain wooden chair of Roylott. Room and sees evidence that he must have been standing on it in order to put his poisonous snake through the ventilator. No doubt he would also be seen standing on that chair to recapture the snake when it returned. But when Holmes lashed it with his cane, the snake returned before doctor was prepared to slip the noose around it. Find their meaning. One speckled. Having very small marks of a different color from the surface on which they are found. Two, terrible, very unpleasant or serious or of low quality. Three, ventilator, an opening or a device that allows fresh air to come into a closed space. Four, occurred to come into existence. Five, clamped to hold something very firmly in a particular position. Six, peculiar, different form of unusual or normal. Match the following: Column A, Column B. One, widow, a woman who has lost her husband by death. Passion, interest, precisely, exactly, examined, thoroughly checked, terrified, extremely frightened. Ventilator, an opening in the wall of air to circulate freely in room, etc. Tick the right options. One. Dr. Roylott loved both his stepdaughters. False. Two. Julia was killed by a swamp adder, the deadliest snake in India. True. Three. The whistling sound came from Dr. Roylott's room. False. Four. Holmes was indirectly responsible for Dr. Roylott's death. True. Communication. Writing skills. Complete the following story with the help of the hints given below. Once a quarrel broke out between the sun and wind. Both claimed that he was stronger than the other. They saw a man. He was wearing coat. They decided to try their strength on the man. Whoever makes the man put off his coat will be the winner. The wind tried first. It began to take off his coat. The man 
blew harder his coat tightly the wind failed the sun shone brighter the man felt hot and clasped the sun became the winner reading skills read the sentences and answer the questions that follow 1 it is fear mr holmes it is terror a who said these words and to whom b who what state of mind would you guess from the speaker's expression c of what fear or terror the speaker is talking 2 have you ever heard anyone whistle in the dead of the night a who said their words and to whom b was there anyone who was whistling in the dead of the night c where was the whistling sound coming from according to the girl what was it in fact 3 